but let me give you a little bit about my background. I'll let Karen talk a little bit about her background and then talk about how we got to this point in developing this hybrid learning and assessment format. So I'm a pediatrician um, and I've been in the medical education world now for 10 years. Uh, started my career really teaching and directing the doctoring course at the New Jersey Medical School. Did that for eight years and then recently moved over to my new position, which is the assistant dean. And really what my job is, is to oversee the first two years at the medical school. And in that role, I'm driven to really find um, platforms that will help our learners kind of master the material that they need to master in order to become the position they need to become. Um, but I will be the first to say I am probably very tech illiterate, um, as my kids tell me. I'm not tech savvy at all, um, but what I'm really fortunate to have is my uh, instructional design specialist, uh, Karen Harris, who basically sits right outside my office. I'm wow. sure she cringes when I say that, and she hears the hollering from my office saying, I need help! Um, but she's really been instrumental in helping kind of take the ideas that we've had and putting them into a format that's um, somewhat adaptable to our students. I'm going to talk a little bit about that. Um, I'm Karen, and I've been at NJMS for two years now. And I will say that working at a medical school is unique. So a lot of what I've been doing for these couple of years is listening. <laughs> Just listening to what they are already doing and trying to be as creative as possible and also develop things that um, don't break. <laughs> so that when we implement, you know, we test and test and then we try to implement and, and hope that the first iteration goes smoothly enough that we try it again. So um, let me begin a little bit with the objectives. Um, and I'm going to talk a little bit about the importance of having to identify curriculum goals, because I think that's a driving factor in how you decide you know, what path you're going to go down. And then the needs of your learner, um, you know, exactly how they learn, you know, how they process things. The only thing I did not put up here is also the need of your instructor. Um, because I think that's a very important piece, too, um, when you're trying to decide what kind of format to use. Then we're going to talk, I'm going to talk a little bit, or actually Karen and I will talk a little bit about describing the steps of a blended, form, uh, blended learning format, which complements, we did a face-to-face -face and online kind of combination approach, um, and I'll talk a little bit about what we learned from that, and then the lessons learned um, from all of this. And we've been doing this now, this is our third year doing it. Um, to give you some background, we actually started this format in Moodle, um, and then moved it over to Canvas. And the reason I stress that is because I think it's really important to understand that you can do these types of things in any of your learning management platforms. It's just about figuring out what you need and just really working with the system to make it work for you. Um, but by all means, it's not an easy process. Um, it's very time consuming and we'll talk a little bit about yeah, And I, if anybody's been in any other sessions with me, one of the questions I always ask after someone shows me what they have created, I say, how do you deliver it? What do you do to deliver it? So that's where the learning management system comes into play. And, and sometimes transferring from one to the other can be a little bumpy. <laughs> okay, so let me talk a little bit about our uh, medical school's driving force, just to give you some perspective. So um, this is the core and trustable professional activities for entering residency. And you know, our job as medical educators is really to make sure that we prepare our students for the next transition which is becoming the physician that they sign up you know, to be. And so this is kind of the, um, the force that we look at. There's 13 clinical competencies that we need to sign off on. Um, and although schools haven't mandated this, a lot of residency programs now are slowly coming back to the medical school and saying, you know, okay, will you say that this student is confident enough to do a history and a physical examination? Will you sign off on that piece of paper? So that's slowly coming our way. And because it's coming our way, we need to decide as educators, how do we, you know, at the end of four years say, yes, the student can do this. Yes, the student can do that. So we needed to develop a format that would allow us to kind of monitor this progress over time. Um, and that was really why we developed this hybrid um, kind of learning platform. So the driving force for us um, is that the medical students 
uh, need to provide an oral presentation of a clinical encounter. Um, and what I mean by that is, you know, students need to go in with a patient, they need to get some history <coughs> information, then they need to do a physical examination, and then they um, need to come out and present that to a team or an attending. Um, and residency programs really need to know that students can do this before they enter residency. Um, and so for us, what we needed to do was we need to find uh, multiple opportunities in the preclinical years for students to practice. So to talk a little bit about the medical school education, it's four years. We have two years where they basically are in lectures, small groups, you know, we've got workshops, simulations, things like that. And then during year three and year four, they're on the floors in the um, respective uh, specialties and they're with attending the same patients. And that's where they get that hands-on experience. So the challenge for us was, you know, what do we do in the first two years? How do we get these students these types of experiences that would somewhat simulate the third year when you're on bedside rounds, where you're walking around from room to room and you're presenting in the moment? Um, and we needed to find a way to do that in the first two years of their education. We also needed to show progression towards competency to be assessed throughout the medical school. So we had to show that every year that they finished, they were ready for the next step. You know, so year one, normally it's a basic history physical. Year two, we expect them to be able to now put some of this into clinical reasoning, um, to draw in some labs. By year three, they're supposed to be able to do that um, within the specialty that they're in, um, and so forth. So we needed to document the progression. And then we, need, we needed to also develop a standardized rubric to benchmark the practice. You know, so with all the faculty who are involved in teaching, we needed every faculty member to assess our student the same way. You know, and so the question was, you know, how do you develop that rubric? Um, you know, how do you design that on an online learning management system so this way faculty are all giving the same scores to their students? And you gotta remember, you know, at least in the medical world, um, oral presentation, I call, is an art. You know, I mean, yeah, we have standards and goals, but it's an art and everybody does it a little bit differently because it's public speaking. Um, and so we have to kind of take that into consideration, but there are benchmarks within that that every student needs to hit. And that was something that we had to develop. Um, mm -hmm. And we're gonna show you in a little bit how, how we develop that. Okay, I don't wanna really go into this slide too much because I didn't realize that our keynote speakers are actually <laughs> gonna talk about this, which was actually, Good for me, um, because I will tell you, you know, I know people don't like using generation names, um, but we do it because we need to figure out who, what kind of people we were kind of dealing with. So I'm going to start with myself um, and say that I am in the generation X, okay, so the baby bus, as people will call it. And for medical school, because we're a higher level of education, most of my students are in the generation Y. Although we are starting to see a couple of the I Gen, Gen Z students. Um, and that's really important to just kind of keep in mind because that was a bit of a driving force for us. Um, because I will tell you, when I started this 10 years ago, when I started teaching, I was fresh out of residency um, and then going into teaching, it was a huge eye opening experience to deal with a different subset of students that wasn't like you and learning to be able to kind of connect with them. Um, but I'm going to focus a little bit more about the millennials because that's really uh, our, at least our target here at the medical school. So again, without going into much, um, I'm just going to run through these slides. I think Dr. Uh, Found this morning really stressed the traits, although he talked more about the Gen X, uh, I mean the Gen Z, Z. traits. Yep. Um, and so that's what he focused on. And I will tell you, I think these two generations do really kind of merge a little bit. There's a lot of similarities between the two generations. Um, and I have kids who are in this new generation, so I see it at home all the time and I get it. Um, but I do know at least with this millennial um, generation, you know, they're a group of students who really like to text. You know, um, and that's the way they communicate with each other. They actually are very participative. They like to be in groups. They like to work together. And that was something we really discovered with our students, is that they like to be with each other to kind of feed off each other and kind of help each other out. They're the forget the rules kind of group of students. You know, what do you mean rules? We don't abide by rules. And that's been very hard for me as an educator to get them to kind of hone in on that. Um, they're really big about feedback. 
you know, did I do well? Did I not do well? I can't tell you how many students I get who's constantly asking me, well, how did I do on this? And, well, why didn't you give me feedback on that? And if you allow that to happen, they're going to come and ask for it. You just got to open that door and say, I'll give it to you. Um, they have a short attention span. I mean, my, my kids now have it too. And I think, you know, they're more about, you know, learning something in a very short amount of time. Um, and so we have to kind of keep that in mind. And my last one is the multitaskers. And we keep hearing this over and over again. You know, they can be, and I'm astounded when I lecture in my lecture hall. I have 180 students, so that's how large the school is. Um, and when I lecture to 180 students, and I like to walk up and down my lecture hall, I can't tell you how many times I see the laptop up with, you know, three pages, you know, one minimized, the cell phone next to them, someone shopping, someone listening to <laughs> lectures, but they're multitaskers. And yet, even though they're multitaskers, they actually, they do pay attention, which was something I wasn't sure they were doing, but they do. You know, they can listen to you and pick out a sweater at the same time, you know, and that's <laughs> what um, And so knowing all these types of traits, uh, you know, we had to say, okay, so what can we do to get our students to become really good on giving oral presentations? Okay. So we have a couple limiting factors at our school. Like I said, class size. So we're a huge class. And if anyone works at an institution where you have large numbers of students, it is really hard to manage in a kind of online course. You know, most online courses that I've been hearing are small. You know, they're small because you don't want to lose sight of the students on the other end. I have 180 students. Faculty is a limiting factor. So for me, most of my faculty are clinicians like me. So unfortunately with that comes the demands of seeing patients. Um, and that's always a challenge for us because all of my clinicians are only, you know, 20, 30 percent effort in the medical school, and yet they're expected to be there to teach, to give one-on-one -on -one feedback, to do grading, and it's a lot of work. Um, and so that's a limiting factor. You know, resources and time. So, you know, at least from the medical school, the um, LCME, which is really the governing board that drives the accreditation of our medical school, they keep telling us that students need to spend less time in lecture and they need to spend more time in active learning. So all this active learning that's driving our education. Um, but what that means is, you know, as we've all learned, and I say all the time, it's so much easier to come into a lecture hall and just lecture to 180 students. I would prefer that because it's not as much work for me as to come in and teach individual groups. There's so much more work involved in that. And now you throw that on top of the fact that the clinicians don't have a lot of time, so what do you do to kind of fix all of that and to make it work? Um, the last piece is this longitudinal assessment. So like I said, we need to track our students from year one to year four as to how they're doing. Unfortunately, what happens with the learning management system is it's within the course, right? So you set up a course, it's within that course, within that year. And then depending on how you set it up, that course might close, right? And then the student moves on to the second course. What we dis discovered with our student is there's not a single student out there who wants to go in to every single course that they've taken to be able to go back and look for stuff that they need, right? So if they need it, either one, they need to download it onto their laptop and keep a file of some sort. Um, if they don't do that, to ask the students to go back into these prior courses to find things um, proves to be a little bit difficult and students often will not go back in and look for it. So we had to find a way to allow the students to be able to see all of this stuff over the four years um, that they're there. And, and that's something that we did. So I'll, I'll talk to uh, you a little bit about that. Okay, so the whole essence of this uh, PowerPoint is hybrid. Um, and what I mean by hybrid is we did a combination of asynchronous and synchronous um, type of format. And I will tell you, all these words are very new to me. Um, I keep looking at Karen because she was the one oh. who taught it <laughs> to me. Um, but we have competencies. These are our six core competencies that really drive our education. And really what we needed to look at was uh, reflective practice was one of the things that we had to think about, you know, so it, it's really funny how we kind of stumbled upon this, you know, for
for the longest time, traditionally, the way we have our students learn is they come into a group kind of like this, and once they've obtained and gathered all that information, they present to the attending in the room. Right? And that's the way I learned, and that's the traditional way. Um, which is great, you get immediate feedback in the room, right? And then you walk out. Um, and that's it, and then you're done. So if you're the student who's intuitive, and who keeps a journal of all the feedback that you've gotten, you're gonna be able to take that and over time build on it and get better, right? But I have students who will be in the room, they'll get the feedback, and then they'll walk out of the room and two months later, they'll like look at you like they've never gotten that feedback. Um, and so you have those types of learners and we kept saying, well, how do I fix that? You know, how do I make it so that it's continuous and it's reflective? So one of my colleagues, who's a physician, um, who specializes in medical informatics, randomly said one day, well, why don't we have them record their oral presentation as part of our assessment? And I remember thinking to myself, when I first heard it, no, I'm not doing that, that just sounds ridiculous. So <laughs> didn't think about it again, put it aside. But then I went home, and I saw my husband with my twin boys, I have 12-year-old twin boys, and they are on the travel soccer team. And it was so interesting because for the last two years, he would go out to the soccer field with his camera, much like the one I'm staring at right now, and he would videotape every one of their games. And I came home and I saw the three of them hovered over a computer screen. And I was like, ah, oh, what's going on over there? So I walk over and my husband was showing my kids exactly what they did on the field. And it was so interesting because the coach would say it to them on the field and they could not remember it. But when they saw it, and they didn't really internalize it in that moment, so then they left, and then you'd say it again, and they'd be like, no, that's not the way it happened, because they had a total different iteration of how things played out. But what was so interesting was watching my husband give that same feedback to my kids, except it was on video. And the nice thing about that was there was nothing my kids could argue about, right? Even if they didn't want to see it, it was already there. But they got to internalize that. And then what they would do is, the next game, they would fix themselves because of what they actually saw. And they would go back and replay the video over and over again because they had something to go back to. And so when I saw that at home, I said, ah, oh, maybe my colleague does, is onto something. And maybe doing some self-recordings for these students might be something that might promote their learning. So reflective practice was something that made us consider this hybrid. The other thing is this kind of one-to-one -one feedback. Um, and this is why we decided to do a hybrid. So we needed to think about some platform that would allow not only a group feedback, right, which happens when you're in the room with them, but also one-to-one -one feedback. <coughs> we were really looking for that um, because I think that's really critical um, for your learners. <clears throat> and then the next one is also the group, right? So you can't take away the group interaction. Um, you need to have your students learn to be in the group. You need them to learn to give each other feedback in front of other people. You know, so the one-to-one -one is nice because it's private between the two people and no one else will see it. But then you need the group to happen so this way people can learn from each other how to give feedback and they can also understand the importance of constructive feedback. Um, so that's the group one. And, you know, so this is the feedback piece. And then, you know, the other thing here is, you know, we want to be able to kind of have an objective. We want our students to understand the importance of, you know, why this is and to see kind of the end goal of everything. Um, and, you know, most of our learners won't get engaged if they don't see the end product. You know, they don't see what they're striving for then they won't put that much oomph into it. Um, and so by establishing this type of format, the students had these uh, videos that they could see as an end product. And then finally, the last thing is snapshots. Um, we wanted them to see over time, from year one to year four, how they progress. You know, and it's really great. I mean, we're only three years into it, so we don't have quite the full four years yet. But it's nice to hear your second your students say, oh, I went back and looked at my first year video and go, oh my gosh, that's the way I looked. You know, this is how far I've come, you know, since then. And I think that's really important for the learner to, to see and internalize. And the format that we developed, I think, is a mm -hmm. great way to do that. Um, I mean, just to, to talk about the snapshots for a minute, one mm -hmm. of the things I, I hear from the students is that their first 
to second iteration, they will videotape themselves and videotape themselves again and again. But then as they move through this, they might need to just do it once or twice because it, it becomes something that they've, they've developed. It's a skill. So now I'm going to talk about the nitty gritty okay, <laughs> as to exactly how we did this. So the implementation was um, the way we have it done is so I have 180 students. I have 15 faculty members. So every faculty member has 12 students. Um, and they get these 12 students for four years. Um, we run one hour ses sessions, so it's six students for every hour. So faculty will be there for two hours, but the students will only come for every hour. So, you know, six students for one hour, they leave, the next six students come in. And that's how we rotated the students out. They do this once um, for every course that they're in. So the organ system course that we have, um, we have the musculoskeletal and integumentary system, cardiovascular, pulmonary, digestive, and neurology, psychiatry, and biostat. So this is all in the first two years. And we do have plans, ultimately, to kind of implement some of this into year three and year four, in addition to the bedside rounds. Um, so, so the way it works, and then Karen's going to talk about the logistics, sure. is um, in the six students that we had in an hour, we divided the students in half. So three students would have to submit an oral presentation online in the system that we built for them. Three of the students would present live. Okay, so the way it worked was that the three students who had to submit the oral presentation were told to submit it midway through the course. They would submit it to their group, so only their group would see it and their faculty member. Then what would happen is once they submitted it, then we would have a deadline for the rest of the students to do peer evaluation from home, watching these videos, including the attending. So the attending would watch the video, and we had a rubric, and Karen's gonna go into that. All the other students would watch from home as long as they met the deadline, and then they would give feedback to that student, okay? So that was the first part of this exercise. So before they end up face-to-face, those who have delivered through a video, they're going to have five peers plus the faculty member. So they'll have six reviews already, six individual feedbacks for that one time that they've recorded. And this is before they meet. Before they actually go, person. right. All happening beforehand, right? So then what happens is that all happens, the deadline closes, and then a couple days later, the six students come into the classroom with a faculty member. Um, and now, the three students who are expected to present live, so they haven't submitted an oral presentation on uh, Canvas, the three students who are presenting live will then do it live like we traditionally do it in, in our education. So we did a hybrid of, of it. But the feedback that they get in that live face-to-face -face is also in the rubric that's in Canvas. So even those who presented live still get feedback that they can, although they won't see themselves in a video, they'll see the five peers and the faculty member who have given them that synchronous feedback. Yeah, you had a question? Yeah, so these videos are uploaded where? So that's we're the, gonna, we're that's getting the there. We're that's the, that's the, we're the, the, that's we're the, the, about the <laughs> How do you, do you determine who does live versus? It's just a random selection. So the way and we it do swaps. it is we, we keep swapping. So I have five courses, so we just um, published early on who's doing recorded, we split the class in half. Uh, so in each group, it was half for one course, half for the other course, and we just flipped it. It's random, total random. So, I mean, because we only have five courses, one, uh, 90 of the students will only submit two, uh, three videos, or two live. Uh, so it wasn't even, uh, but it wasn't about that. You know, it was really about maximizing the resources that we had and figuring out a system that we could have in place that the students could always go back to. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, so but and imagine that's 90 videos that have to get reviewed. put in the system and I then review. The ones that are not videotaped. We don't record those. Yeah. So when they're live. But you could. We could record that. We have <laughs> you not could. done that yet. We have way too many videos. <laughs> <laughs> you could. We, we've we've had this conversation. So the way it works is they present live. So all the students bring in their laptops. Mm -hmm. They have the rubrics open. Okay. So what happens is in they Canvas. present in Canvas. So they present live. Once they present live, we tell the group and the faculty to give yourself a minute or two to fill out the rubric. 
So they all fill out the rubric on Canvas so it gets, can get submitted into the system so the students can review it later. Okay, so. Yeah, so it does get submitted into the system. And then after they submit it, then we actually still do live feedback. Okay. So what we tell the students to do is, it's been a great tool, they use the form um, to give the verbal feedback. Um, and the dialogue is really important because I think, you know, I'm a bit, I'm a bit of a skeptic because I'm a pediatrician. I'm a hands-on person. I was always worried about losing the essence of the feedback with an online system, with an asynchronous system, because I think there's something to be said about delivering feedback personally, right? Like the, the tone in your voice, uh, the face, facial expressions that you make, are things that really get lost when you do it online. Um, so we had to do a hybrid to ensure that we did not lose that other component. Of but it. but I do want to mention that none of the feedback is anonymous. Yes. So oh even, uh, and this this was new for me when I first started. I said, oh, we can do peer review. It could be anonymous. And Dr. Chen looked at me. No, <laughs> they need to know where it's coming from, uh, and and the, those who are giving it need to know that. But doesn't that inhibit some people? So it might. Um, we don't actually grade, so we evaluate our students, and I tell the students, your evaluation of your feedback is about how in-depth that feedback is, you know, because I keep reminding them, you know, even, even, you know, in the position that I'm in, we're always, we're creatures where we can always learn to improve, right? And that doesn't stop. Doesn't matter how old you get, that's always going to be part of your life. So what we try to teach our students is you've got to learn how to give professional, constructive feedback that's going to help other people improve. So, so that's what, the other side of the coin in right. a way. So but what faculty do, and they're very in tune with this, is my faculty are trained to make sure that the students give those types of feedback, right? So if I had a student, and I ran this for a, couple of, uh, for a year, if I had a student in my group who said, oh yeah, you did great, and that was it. I would not let that go. You know, I would say, okay, let's go back. Why did that student do great? You know, tell me what was it about the presentation that you thought was great? And I have to literally tease that out of the student. But that's part of their learning process. Mm -hmm. That's why for us, doing it live, the hybrid was really important. If we had gone fully online, this uh, the online piece would have taken away that piece of it. But what we found is the online part of it actually had some advantages that we were surprised to have discovered in the process of all of this. Um, but yeah, so we do do live feedback. Um, and then the students get to see it online when they go home because they have to fill out the form. And now they can go home and internalize everything, review the rubric, and decide for their next presentation how are they going to make it better. And that was the whole point of it. And, and the hope, I think, also is when the next iteration does happen, we, we hope that they will look at their previous quick review, the feedback that they got, so they can like, be like Dr. Chen's sons and get on the field and, and do it, and do it yeah. the way <laughs> that it's supposed to be done. Yeah. yeah. So we do tell our students to bring in their laptops. Um, that has to be there, and our system needs to be up and running for us to be able to make this happen. So just to make sure I'm following this, yeah. six students come together, end of the semester, three have a live yeah. performance or a presentation review, mm -hmm. and then the three that, that uploaded a video, there's no live component to that? Not for that first, uh, not for that session. They no, had the live the next course, so we flip it in I the next that. course. Right. So everyone will always do an oral, give an oral presentation. Mm -hmm. okay. The question is, how do they deliver that oral presentation? Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. half will do a recording at home, submit it online for it to be evaluated. The other half will come into the group and give it live in front of the group, and then we flip it for the next course. And, and they all, I'm sorry, and they all have this peer review piece. So I think that they're learning as well when they watch their peer sometimes to see their mistakes and their strengths and say, wow, you know, the way they delivered it, I'm going to try to take that, on, you know, as my next goal. Do the students um, themselves have a preference? I mean, do, do you find that some feel like, <laughs> oh, you know, I'd really much rather be able to, you know, do you take the 856 at home and upload it or live, or do people ever feel cheated? Like, you know, really, it should be live. Um, so we have a, it's a mixed review. Um, I can tell you, and I'm gonna talk more about it, but I'll kind of touch on it now. The students found that when they had to do the submission for the recording, so, you know, at least my students, they're perfectionists. You know, they could not submit a video without it being perfect. So by default, 
they ended up self re-recording themselves a hundred times mm -hmm. to get that right video. Mm -hmm. um, it actually made the students crazy. Um, and the feedback was, I don't like this, I don't want to re-record myself 10 times to have it because they were really afraid of what was being put out there. Mm -hmm. um, and that was something the students did not like. But what the students learned over time is they just said, you know what, after the third take, I was done. Like, I'm just not going to fixate on this, it is what it is, it's just going in. Um, so that was one feedback we got. Uh, but interestingly, the live students, so when we did this for the first time, the live students said, watching their peers with the recordings before they came in and did it live helped. Mm -hmm. Because what they did was, what they didn't realize was they were watching other people's style. And you know, if you're not good at this, you don't know how to do this, right? So the students are always begging me, can you, you know, record a perfect oral presentation that we can watch? <laughs> and my answer to that always is no. I refuse to. Why? Because there's nothing perfect about any of these oral presentations. Everyone has a different style. Um, and so I kept saying, I will not record one because I want you to establish your own stuff. But I want you to watch other people's presentation and then say to yourself, oh, what did I like about that? What can I bring into my presentation and try it for myself? That's what the recordings did for the students that are live. So, and we didn't know that. We had no clue that that was gonna happen, but that was the feedback. So the students who came in live said, oh, we have a better sense as to what to do. We saw some things that worked really well. We tried to put that into our, our presentation style. We saw some things that didn't go very well. Therefore, we decided we weren't gonna go down that road. And they made kind of their own canvas based on what they saw. Um, so we got kind of a mixed review as to you know what people's thoughts were. Um, oh yeah. So I was just curious, so everyone ends up getting a video yes. that they can watch? Yes. Okay. Yes. Yeah. More, than more than one. More than one. one. It's two years. Because it's so five, five iterations. Two years. Oh, okay. Yeah, so it's somewhere between two to three videos right. that you'll do. Uh, so it's either two videos and three live, or three videos and two live, depending on the sequence that you fell into. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so with that, are you still getting the... How do I get an A mentality? Always. <laughs> always. Always. Yeah, always. And it's interesting because um, we'll talk a little bit about the rubric. We established the rubric, so this way everyone, students and faculty, use the same rubric. And I kept telling our students, if you read the rubric, it actually tells you how the points are assigned. You know, so, I mean, we are, I think we're pretty transparent. Yeah, it cuts it um, off at the pass. But the issue is, it's not, so presentation, to me, has two components, right? So you have the style, right? The you know presentation, how it looks. So that's one. And the other piece is the content. Right. Um, and so content is something that you really varies with the student, right? If a student is a strong student with a strong fund of knowledge, they're more likely to be more cohesive when they present these oral presentations because it's tied to a clinical diagnosis. Okay, so that's the piece of it. But style is a very different piece of this kind of um, presentation. And you don't have to be, in my opinion, a student who's really smart to be really good at giving a presentation, right? Because you might be just really good at talking in front of a group of people. So there's two very kind of different factors that weigh into this. Um, and that's why you know students will nitpick as much as they can about the A. And at the end of the day, it's, it's an art. It's an art that I need them to just keep practicing at, whether they realize it or not. The student feedback that you share, is that over the five years, or is that after each course that you're kind of just grabbing some of the, some of the stuff that you're sharing? So the, it, it's in each course, mm -hmm. um, and the nice thing about what we did was they stay with their group the entire time. Mm -hmm. So it grows over time. And, and the feedback is immediate? Yes. So the moment... One of their peers no, I, I submits. Guess I think I was thinking about the feedback we shared that the students that um, went live oh. felt better off. Yeah. Uh, uh, so we did it. It's, it's, we got that feedback at the end of the course and also at the end of the year. Uh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, at the end of the course, um, when we, the first iteration, we looked for feedback because it was the first time that they were doing it. And then we looked for that again at the end of the academic year because they had done it three times. So now we want a kind of more of a better understanding uh -oh. as to longitudinally speaking, how did that play out? Because, you know, once you've done it several times and you can anticipate things, then your perspective of the format changes slightly. So, okay, yeah. Is it when you implemented the online yeah. portion? 
You were surprised to learn some benefits? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was the self-reporting, the reflective practice. So, you know, I, you know, when we did, when we did this, even though I was hoping for some reflective practice, I did not realize how many times our students would self-record themselves. I really didn't, you know, mm -hmm. like, I, I mean, I should have known because I'm a physician and I do a lot of lectures and I remember, you know, wanting to re-edit my own lectures, but in my mind, it never dawned on me that these students would spend so much time at home self-recording themselves for that perfect video. Um, and then to top, to kind of um, add, I guess, salt to that, the issue is when you self-record at home, you don't really have anyone you're looking at. So what they do is they um, do it in front of their computer and they're looking at the um, camera. It's in your own home, it's just you. I mean, I guess you can invite friends to listen, but at, a lot of my students were doing this at like 10 o'clock at night, you know? So the feedback was, you know, you're staring at this artificial platform. It's not really an audience. And then now you have to self-record yourself. You know, some of my students said that they would put, you know, the girls would put stuffed animals in front of them. <laughs> and they would like look at the stuffed animals so that at least they felt like they were looking at someone. You know, the guys, I don't know what the guys did, but the girls did better. <laughs> but they would like, they needed something physical to look at and kind of felt like that was, that made the process harder versus being in a room and looking at faces, right? Because then they couldn't adjust how they presented. Mm -hmm. They couldn't adjust any of that, right? They would just speak and then hope for the best that it looked really good on the other end. Um, versus for us, like here, I can look at body language and say, oh, someone's falling asleep on me or, you know, someone's, you know, really excited. And that would help me adjust my presentation. So that's why, because they didn't get that feedback from other people, it led to this process of re-recording a hundred times. But for me, the re-recording actually was perfect. Because we keep telling our students to practice. And they don't practice. Mm -hmm. They will not practice mm -hmm. unless you are standing next to them saying you must practice. So if I were to leave them alone, which we do all the time, honestly, my students would care less about this. It, it, they wouldn't even think about it unless they were forced to. So we realized that it forced them to practice. And that could have been, that could not have worked out better for me. Mm -hmm. um, because otherwise they would not, there's no way you're going to get a student who's going to actively find someone every week and say, let's practice our oral presentation. Mm -hmm. They've got too much stuff they have to read and study for that that's really hard. Mm -hmm. But yet it's a skill that I have to check off on um, and I have to say that they're good at. So. And I was explaining to Dr. Chen just uh, a few days ago, a student came to me and said, you know, oh, I re recorded, re-recorded, re-recorded. She said, I, I know how to edit video. I could have just gone in and clipped out my mistakes. She said, but I knew that that would be defeating the purpose, so I didn't do that. So they do understand that there is this practice going on that is valuable. Yeah. So, okay, so we should quickly show... about the delivery. So, so Karen's going to talk about the delivery of it. Kaltura, Kaltura, Kaltura. Um, <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's where the videos are. Um, it's, it's a server, there's the space, that's where they're uploading it. I don't know how many of you are using Canvas at this point, but I build a Canvas peer review assignment. Um, it's the same as any assignment, you just check off that you want it to be a peer review assignment. Um, we have a rubric that you can build in Canvas. And you can even, for those of you who are starting to dapple in rubrics, you can set it up so that there are outcomes so you could see what's going on over time in each criteria of your rubric at some point, if you're thinking that far ahead. So where Dr. Chen's talking about um, content and, and style, we could hopefully at some point track that um, in those outcomes in the rubric. So we should take a look. Of course, we create a course shell. So your students might have other courses going on. This course shell is longitudinal, so we want it to stay there. The idea is that it's somewhat like an e-portfolio. I haven't found an e-portfolio here at Rutgers yet that anybody is really using um, consistently. So I, we, we can turn a course shell into that kind of, of tool. So they could, again, go back even when they're in later courses and look at their previous videos. So yeah, we have to go fast, sorry. So um, I'm not gonna go too much into this, but section versus group. Um, this is a Canvas specific uh, function, although every learning management system has groups, we went with sections. Groups are about 
group projects usually. That this is not a group project. Um, these are, it really, the sections foster one-to-one -one activities. We also want to be sure that our faculty only see those 12 students. We don't want them to be intimidated trying to find them through the 180 students that we have. So we went with sections. Um, and then we're creating a module for each iteration. And I just bumped the most recent one up to the top. You know, in Canvas, you can just drag that up. So right now, we're actually in oral case presentation two right now, the cardiovascular system. Um, the, there's content, of course, because this is a relatively intensive effort on the part of the student. So they can download the rubric and look at it as much as they need. If they're watching a video, they might want that paper copy to be looking at or even jotting notes on. Faculty love to have a paper copy to jot notes on. So again, the paper version is there. Um, there's always instructions that I put up for submitting the video and instructions for peer feedback. So again, you don't want your students to get lost in this process. It should be quick, so I developed step-by-step -step instructions. Um, video submission examples are good to have not perfect ones. Sometimes it's even good to have a, a bad video or two so they can see what it, it looks like. Um, and um, we're piloting adding a written piece to this. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so um, this is what the assignment looks like. This is a, a capture of what I see, but the students would see a blue submit button at the top. Um, you create um, a uh, the rubric also you build and it, it'll come up there so they can see the rubric as well as have that, that paper possibility. Um, the type of submission is a text entry box. I know that sounds strange, but um, when you build this assignment, um, the text entry box would allow you to put in any kind of media. And half of the students are just typing in their name. Those who are presenting live will just type in their name in the text entry box. So when they do the live piece, it's a placeholder, it's a placeholder so they'll know who they're submitting a peer review of. But you can also use the Kaltura button to embed the video. The video, uh, just to be sure everyone knows, the students are putting in My Media. So they, they upload to My Media, and then when they go to submit and they click on Kaltura, they'll just see it there and embed it. Okay, um, uh, these are the, the basic settings, which I, I'm not gonna go into, you know, beyond saying that this is, you know, you add the rubric like this by clicking on the plus rubric button, and you, you build a custom rubric based on, you know, what you're measuring. But this is just to show, like, there are a lot of settings you have to consider yeah. when you develop a um, format like this, okay? Um, peer review allocation, so we have these groups, and we need to assign, um, Canvas is nice that you could just do a, you know, five per, you know, peer. we end up doing it manually because our groups are never perfectly six. So you can manually assign or you could let it do it for you. For you. An example of instructions. You'll really need an instruction sheet. Um, you know, students recording and uploading the video. Some, you might think that they know what they're doing. Not everybody does. Um, so there'll always be a certain percentage of students. So if we have 90 students uploading a video, I'm going to get 10 to 15 who are having problems. So the better your instructions are, the fewer students hopefully you'll have having challenges. And the same thing, peer review. When you assign it, the students will just see the list of students that they have to review. If there's an exclamation point, it means they haven't done it yet. So they'll get a check mark. Um, you have to have instructions for faculty as well because they're going in and they have to find their students, find the video, find the rubric, figure out how to do it all in speed grader. Speed grader is, I love it. But that, that's just a personal endorsement to say it, it's a place where you can do some more complicated setup than in other places I've experienced grading. Um, we've created a, a pretty um, complex rubric. So I'd like to mention a good part of that is that many might think, well, are they really doing a full peer review? Are they listening to the whole video that their peer is presenting? The, the videos can be anywhere from two to 12 minutes, let's say. So I don't know, do they drag across and not listen? Um, again, uh, Dr. Chen has it set up so that we need to be sure that they've given the chief complaint. And over here in these rubrics in Canvas, you can actually put specific comments. So even if you just give the four points, you can now say why you gave the four points in the comment for each criteria. 
And I have in the rubric, I have questions that I make the students answer that show me that they've listened to the whole video. <laughs> I had to purposely design it that way because I know most of my students will maybe look, listen two minutes into it and then give a score and call it. <laughs> so that was deliberate on my end to ensure that that was going to happen. So. And this is what it looks like. Um, this is within Canvas. So when you go to SpeedGrader, this is what it looks like for faculty. Students' um, view is similar. So they have the video over here. They have a slide bar so they can go back and forth. Um, and they have the rubric right next to it where they're checking off. And, and there's a place where they can put a comment as well, freeform comment at the bottom. So I, I really like this interface. I think it's impressive. But Oh, and... Um, this is uh, so that you can see what the live presentation is like. So the student's name would show up there, and the students have the rubric on their laptops when they meet for face-to-face. -face. Okay, so let me just back it up because I'm out of time. <laughs> There's a couple more slides, but let me just let me talk about lesson learned. So um, this is a great formative, or it's really a great formative assessment because they get immediate feedback. It's something that they can kind of keep forever. It led to unintended practice, which I thought was great. Self-reflection, so even if you do your own and you submit it, there's a lot of self-reflection in that because you would not re-record unless you looked at it and said it sucked or it was not good. Continuous feedback, so they have these videos in this course, which means that when they hit year three, they can go back to that course and watch their videos sequentially. So they can see how they've done over time, which I think is really important. Um, we learned that um, informational technology supports critical. I will not be, um, I will be the first to say without Karen, this never would have happened. And without her patience <laughs> with dealing with me and trying to sort through all this, this would not have happened. The last thing is paper backup. Of course. So you always need paper backup because we have encountered systems where the wire, the internet goes down or too many computers are logged on. And so we have always carried paper versions in the room ready to hand out. And then what we do is then we manually enter it on the back end. It's labor intensive, but allows us to keep moving in this type of uh, format. Um, and then, you know, it's time consuming. You gotta train your faculty. It is rigid. The recordings itself is rigid to a certain extent. And as our students have told us, can seem very artificial because they're talking to themselves. Um, and that's just the way it is. Uh, this is just an overview of what we discussed, which is in the um, handout. If you haven't picked one up already, it's like right next to the projector.